begin on a series on transformation and renewal. And uh, I just have three little points to share on transformation and renewal. And uh, uh, as, a, as a conclusion to the little short series on transformation and renewal, which was based on Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Now let's have a look again at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, as there's a key text by which we have that um, uh, little understanding in this series. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And uh, we found that in verse 2, it mentions transformation and renewal. And uh, in these two particular aspects, seeing that we are to be transformed and renewed in our heart and mind, I just to share the conclusion part in this series, and that is, uh, number one, look at the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And uh, in Romans 8, We look first of all <coughs> at verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And uh, the first thing is that, the first point is that every circumstances hard circumstances, easy circumstances, uh, difficult uh, in a valley or easy times on a mountain, everything that occurs in our life, everything that occurs in our relationship with people is for one purpose and one purpose alone. That we be conformed to the image of Christ. Think about that. Every situation and every circumstances that we face, whether hard or easy, is with one purpose and that somehow we be transformed to be like Christ. That means, point number one, that every situation is an opportunity for us to find some strength, some grace, or some principle inside us that will respond in such a manner that we will be more Christ-like through that situation. Of course, we all know it's not the easiest thing, right? When someone gets angry at you, you just want to get angry and slap them back. And uh, when someone reacts at you, you want to react back. And it's not the easiest thing in a natural. But when we choose not to respond in a carnal way or in a natural way, but when people bark at you or when people scold you, when, when people misunderstand you and when people misinterpret you or when people persecute you, you choose only one response. You choose the most Christ-like response possible. And when you make that choice to respond the way Christ Respond. You ask yourself this question. What would Christ do in that situation? What, how would Christ respond in that situation? And then when you choose to respond the way Christ responds, you have succeeded in that situation. Success is not measured based on how popular we become in this life, not based on how much more material we have accumulated in this life, not based on how much greater a reputation we have established uh, with men, and uh, it is not based on any of these, but it is based on only one thing and one thing alone, that you would be able to successfully be transformed in that situation to be a little bit more Christ-like. And so that's the first point, that if we understand that the purpose of all circumstances, the purpose of all persecution, the purpose of all our being misunderstood, the purpose of every, every hard time 
is with one purpose and one purpose alone for God to allow it. That is, for us to find the grace of God to respond in the most Christ-like manner. And when you find the grace of God to respond in the most Christ-like manner, you have won. The enemy has lost. Unfortunately, if we do not respond in the most Christ-like manner, we lose. And the enemy wins. So that's the first point, to respond in such a manner that coming out of the circumstances, we become transformed. Now what happens if we do not respond correctly? One year down the road, two years down the road, different set of circumstances will take place. Similar but different. Similar in the fact that you are still the same main actor in your sin. The people around are different. Circumstances are different. But you will still have the choice to respond in that situation. And God keeps repeating the cycle round and round and round until we respond one day correctly and because of that, we become transformed. A little bit more transformation comes into our life. So that's the first purpose of, uh, uh, first point, the purpose of all situations in life. Every, a l not a single situation is excluded because God is able in every temptation and every trial to give you the grace to overcome in a Christ-like manner. So point one, Every situation is designed with a purpose that we respond in the most Christ-like manner so that we can become transformed to the image of Christ. Point number two, Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. It tells us here in uh, verse 3 to 4, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience and your obedience and when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, look at verse, verse 4 and 5. It says that the weapons God gave to us is to pull down strongholds, verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We're talking about transformation and renewal. In point one, we talk about every circumstances, what is to be done. And here it talks about every thought. Every single thought that we have, that we permit in our lives, has a role in our transformation or our deformation. You know how people become deformed? Now all of us are growing physically every year, but we're also growing spiritually. Have you noticed that as you grow through the years, one, at, one year at a time, that you can either become a better person or a more ugly person in the natural and in, the, in, in your soul? And we're not talking about outward looks alone. But you know how sometimes people's personality are beautiful? They have a beautiful personality. But yet we know that beautiful personalities can become ugly also through time. Maybe through pain, hurts, unforgiveness, bitterness. And then a, a beautiful person in a personality after 10 years can become an ugly person. Horrible person where you cannot go near. They become like porcupines. You go near, you, you get hurt. Every time you go near, you get hurt by them. And only those who can take and stand their hurt can keep on being near to them. And why does these things happen? It all starts with the thought life. It all starts in our mind. And yes, even born again Christians struggle in their thinking and in their mind. And uh, just, just pause a moment and go over to the book of Acts. At a guy named Simeon, in Acts chapter 8, a guy named Simeon. And... Uh, 
in Acts 8, we are told here that after he was born again and baptized in water, that uh, there were there were a lot of uh, uh, there were a lot of people being prayed for by Peter and John to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and um, and then he asked to have the power of God to pray for people to receive the baptism in the Spirit by offering money. It was like a bribe. And Peter rebuked him because it was wrong. It was obviously wrong. And Peter says in verse 20, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. And he says, first of all, in verse 28, Your heart is not right in the sight of God. And then in verse 22, Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Look at it. The thought of your heart. So first of all, he says in verse 21, their heart was not, his heart was not right, in the, not in the right place. And then the reason why his heart was not in the right place was because he kept thinking the wrong thoughts. And he allowed the wrong thoughts to, 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 to grow in his life. As it has been said, you know, the, bird, uh, the, the, birds, the birds can fly by above your head, but don't let them build a nest on your head. And uh, wrong thoughts can come to anyone, anywhere, anytime. But don't meditate on them and allow them to become a part of you. That's where transformation uh, or deformation can take place. And uh, um, in, in regard to this area of, of, of thoughts, there are different areas and different levels that the thoughts can develop into. In fact, uh, let's look over at the book of James and see the process by which thought becomes a stronghold in everyone's life. Uh, in, the book of, uh, Tim, uh, in the book of James. The book of James. We see here in the book of James, and it tells us here in verse 13 to 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Let each one, each, when each, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, and enticed, and then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now notice the process. It starts as a thought or a temptation. It becomes a desire. And when desire has conceived, that means desire becomes an action. And then when an action is done, it becomes sin or death. Four steps. It starts as a thought. And if you think something long enough, and you meditate on those thoughts long enough, and allow it to come day by day until you're obsessed with those thoughts, it becomes a desire, a good or bad desire. At the desire level, the thoughts begin to affect your emotions. Emotionally, you become affected by it. Then, if you allow the emotion, at that point, helps things can come. As long as you don't reach step four, you haven't seen yet in a sense. You know, you, you, I know God is still dealing, trying to get it out of your life. By step two, where it's become a desire or an emotion in your life, it's, it's begun to grow roots, but still redeemable. But if, if that nothing is done about that, it will go to step three, where an action takes place. A wrong action, because of a wrong emotion, because of a wrong thought. And so at step 3, when the action takes place, it, you begin to road down into sin. And at step 4, as the actions keep on being repeated and repeated and repeated, it becomes a stronghold and a part of your character. And so that's how wrong character and deformation takes place. Now the Bible tells us, that one of the things about love, which many people say, yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love the body of Christ. Yes, I love one another with the love of the Lord. But then they don't obey 1 Corinthians 13, uh, love. This is a love that, uh, that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
And it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in uh, <coughs> looking over here at uh, verse 5, Love does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. And the last part, things no evil. So if you really love with the love of God, you are not capable about thinking evil of people. I mean even of the worst people. You say, oh, how can that be? Is that practical Christianity? Yes. Let's say that you're surrounded by all the negative things, right? And it's challenging your life. And uh, think about it this way. Now, if I, have some, if I want to look for a fault in your life, in any one of your life, and I cross-examine you and watch you day and night like a hawk, do you think that in three months I can find something? <laughs> Obviously. Amen. Maybe 24 hours. Right? Of course we can. Of course you can. And, uh, and so, uh, every one of us have, have faults. And, um, and, I ha- and, and the most important thing is to know where your own faults are. Now, I know, my, I know where my weaknesses are. Should I confess to them, Lord? Oh, yes, they say, confess. Right? Now, uh, let me tell you from my perspective where my, some of my faults are. One of the, thing, one of the things that I, I, ha- I have, which on all these things I'm dealing with, is I am someone who is either 0% or 100%. I do not have anything in between. When I do something, I either do it 100% or I don't do it at all. That, that, that can be a fault, you know, to many people. Because if I help a person, I help 100%. And I never stop helping them until, you know, uh, they tell me, stop. <laughs> And uh, oh, when I do something for a lot, or when I do anything in any area, I do it 100%. So that if everyone around me drop off, you'll find me still doing that. <laughs> because that's my, one of my faults. Uh, I either do it 100% or z- I don't do it at all, 0%. I do not have any percentages in between. <laughs> that has caused problems with many people, <laughs> let me tell you, as they come to know me. Uh, right? And uh, another one of my faults that you may not realize because I have always been very sociable and nice to you, right? Is this. I do not like socializing just to be rapport. Within, in, it's not natural for me. And that is why I tend, you know, I, I seldom, you know, go around and you know, say hello to all the pastors, you know, you know. I only attend, you know, f- fellowships here and there when I, when I feel, it, you know, when I could really justify it. And sadly, most of the time, I couldn't justify it. Because I do not make small talk. And uh, that's one of my faults. I do not like to socialize, just to build rapport. So that when I sit with a person, you notice, I go right to the point in some things. Maybe a few sentences and then hello, and then I go right to the point, to some areas. So I do not, one of my faults is, I do not enjoy socializing to be rapport. And uh, because of that, tends to be, you know, misunderstood. And in in many ways, because uh, I don't go to be rapport. You know, when you be rapport with people, and people hear things about you, they say, oh, I know him, right? But look, I'm, you know, I don't do, go around and, and be in your good books all the time. You know, sit down and chat with you, play card games and Uno with you, Monopoly with you. Right? And, uh, and, and so because you, you are friendly to me, so when you hear something about me, you say, cannot be, you know, he just wasn't in my house, you know, all, all those things. So I don't do that. It's a fault of mine. I, I don't do that. So, uh, working on some of those areas. And uh, <laughs> still, and uh, so that's, that's, uh, that, that's an area that, I, that I'm dealing with uh, uh, in my life. And uh, I remember I list down about seven things. Uh, because I, I list down those seven things because I say, okay, these are areas that I've got to keep working on my entire life. And uh, uh, another third area that I have a problem in dealing, dealing uh, with my own character uh, in myself is I have a tendency never to share any problems that I face with anyone. I tend to just go to fasting and prayer and pray through. That can be a fault because some people want to help 
and some people want to understand, some people want to know. But I tend, whatever I'm facing, you have never heard, none of you have ever heard me complain. None of you have ever heard, even if I'm at the point, you know, and uh, one arrow is piercing my right leg, one arrow is piercing my left leg, one arrow is piercing my hand, and uh, then there's a, there's a danger of me just falling under the uh, precipice or, or cliff, and there's one leg hanging under there, and just hanging there, I still don't tell anyone. I said, let me fast and pray through all this. That can be a fault, right? I tend never, never to share my problems, uh, with anyone because I just go to God and fast and pray through. Right. So sometimes people have to actually try to come near and say, come on, come on, tell me, tell me, I want to pray with you, tell me, tell me. And I say, well, let me pray about it. <laughs> and so that is a fall. Right. That is a fall that I'm working at. Right. Because I realize sometimes people like to pray with you and like to, you know, pray, pray through those things. And uh, uh, fourth area that I have, do have a problem with, right, and uh, so here am I confessing all my faults and I'm going to list out all your faults after that, right? No, alright. And uh, so, fourth thing, uh, this, I feel this is good so you can understand some of my weaknesses, <laughs> right? In case when I'm preaching, some of you say, he's talking about me, ah, right? No, I'm not talking about you. I understand in my own life where my own faults are and I work at them. And uh, another fourth area of one of my faults is that... Um, um, I tend to see a lot of visions and revelations all the time. I don't tell people about it, but they come off and on, visions here and there. And, uh, and because of that, I sometimes tend to get lost in that spiritual world. And I'm just thinking about those things that I pick up in the spirit and, and say. So, there, there's a tendency. Uh, the, f- the fault is that I tend to be a mystic. A mystic. Uh, in fact, if all you do is give me food and water and, uh, and a Bible and say, uh, and, and, and say, would you like to spend the rest of your life in this uh, cave? Say, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I would take it because basically I'm a mystic and I have a tendency to just get too absorbed maybe into that realm. And uh, so these are some of the things, right? And uh, so we are talking about <laughs> we are talking about um, our thought life. Now, you need to understand this. Because of some of these things that are part of my character and Weaknesses too. It could be a strength, it could be a weakness. Remember, every weakness of yours is also a strength. Right? If you're a sociable person, opposite from me, it is your strength. But at the same time, it's your weakness. And uh, so, uh, because of that, I never ever have bad thoughts about people. You may find it unbelievable, but that's me. If I have anything against anybody, I would just directly deal with them and if it's done and finished, it is actually finished with me. And sometimes I even forgot about those things. And even big things that people find hard to forgive. And because there is a measure of concentration that is a part of me. Now, that reminds me of another fifth, fifth fault that I had. <laughs> I love to think, analyze, and uh, I get impatient with people who cannot think, analyze, or see things quickly. I tend never to repeat it. I say, you can't get it once. And, uh, and then the same way, when they tell me, I always say, just tell me once. They tell me twice, is nagging. <laughs> so, that could be a fault. And uh, so, I, so, because of that, I get impatient with people, and I forgot that when I deal with people, I have to repeat. I have to say it several times. I got to present it another 20 ways. So that they understand what's going on up here. What I'm trying to tell them. In here, in my heart, and in my head. And uh, so that's the fault. Um, but basically, up, up in my mind, I do not think evil thoughts of people. I do not entertain them at all. It's been my entire life, which is why I live my life in 
just forgive forgiveness, just forgive and forget, and that's it. I have nothing against anyone. And uh, so love thinks no evil. The love of God in your life is supposed to affect that every time, do you know that every time you have a thought, whether the thought came to you just when you were, you were, you, you were idle, or the thought came to you through the words of somebody, or the thoughts came to you through you reading something, or, or wherever those words came, when those thoughts come and they come into your mind, your conscious mind, you have a choice. You have a choice to accept or reject them. Now, good things and good thoughts, fine. Philippians chapter 4 tells us that whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are righteous and holy, think on those things. Didn't Philippians 4 verse 7 tell us, tells us that? And uh, so, we have thoughts that come to us. When they come to us, they are still at that first stage. Remember four stages. Thoughts, desires, action, and repeated actions become a part of your character. You begin to live in death. And so, the, the, the earlier you stop it in the earlier process, the easier. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, take every single thought and submit it to Christ. And so, when they are submitted to Christ, then you won't have the wrong emotions and desire. And then they won't lead you. Now, by the time you reach step 2 to 3, it is a very difficult thing to resist going the wrong way. Think about it. Because then you will be having what you call the common Christian struggle. I want to do it, but something in me doesn't want to do it. Or, I don't want to do the wrong thing, but something in me wants to do the wrong thing. Can you see the internal conflict? Where something in you is rubbing against another part of you that doesn't want to, want to do. Right and wrong is rubbing. And right and wrong is living in you at the same time. That's going to be painful. That only happens when it's step two and three. The thought has become an emotion. And an emotion constantly brings out even more thoughts. It's a cycle. So thoughts begin to form into a cycle. And so the cycle of thoughts become a habit. Do you know that we all develop habits? Habit as to uh, when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, do you brush it on your left side or right side? Right? Think about that. Some of you don't even think on those things, but you automatically brush your teeth on a certain side first. Or when you eat your food, when after you eat your food, when there's a plate, do you eat it from the back to the front or from the front to the back, or from the right to the left. You watch how people eat afterwards. <laughs> and you see that that displays part of their character in the way they, in, 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 it displays part of their approach to life. In fact, they even say, you could tell a person's approach to life by the way they peel an orange. <laughs> right. So, you know, and uh, so and so, some people would peel it all the way nicely down, right? And always peel origins that way nicely, one big giant piece, right? They are artistic people, right? Even peeling orange, they want to make it an art, right? Other people, they just peel and throw, right? They're the practical people. They just want to get the job done and have that orange, and uh, so and. So the different ways we do different things, it, it, it makes us so different. Now, now just take your, take your hands, your two hands up, right? Your two, two hands up. Put it together and just hold it together. Yeah, now hold it, hold, it, hold it together. Right. Now, look carefully. Is your left thumb over your right thumb or your right thumb over your left thumb? Okay. Now, how many of you have your left thumb over your right thumb? Now, you can let go of your hands now. Your left thumb over your right thumb. Ah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Okay, about 11 of you. And how many of you have your right, the rest of you must have your right thumb or your left thumb, right? Right, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else have hold their hand this way in a funny way, like right exactly in the middle? You must be very unusual. <laughs> Where you have neither thumb over each other. <laughs> okay, so, obviously, 
Now let me describe this to you. Some of us are more right-handed than left-handed. Some of us use our left brain more than our right brain. Right? And it flows out even in the way you cross your hands. Yes. And so, um, when, and, and here's where we're talking about transformation and renewal. Transformation and renewal. When, uh, when, when I was growing up and as God began to deal with my life and I began to uh, transform every year, I felt that I was more an analytical person. Right? Mathematical, analytical, logical. I love logic. And then I realized I need to develop the creative part of me. Right? I am too left brain. And when I was growing up, I always hold my hands with the right thumb over my left thumb. Now, just now, whatever way you held your thumb, right, put your fingers, hands together and make it the opposite way from what you normally do. Yeah. If your left thumb was on your right, now put your right over your left. Do you feel uncomfortable? Oh, yes. Yes, that was how I felt. What about you, left or right? I was going to say, I'm left, I'm left but, but... Sometimes the other way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's, it's okay. Thank you very much. I accept that. I accept that. Interesting. Now, here's the point. When I was growing up, because I was an analytical person, came through a science stream and I always was in the a top science, science stream all the time, I always hold it right over left. Because my left brain, if you remember, your left side of your brain is an analytical part. The right side of your brain is your uh, creative side, and the musical side. Remember, the brain crosses over. So your left is always your right, and your right is always your left brain. Oh yeah, unless your brain is on backwards, which is special for you. Right, we got one special individual there. And so, I always cross my hand this way. Why is it? Yeah, yeah, the right over left. So, so at, during the time when I was in the Baptist seminary, and uh, as I was learning these principles, and I began to realize that God has to transform me and I need to develop certain things in my life. You know what I did? You know how sometimes you act out in faith? And I purposely always cross my hands the other way around. Left over right. It feels very uncomfortable at first. Plus, I purposely write with, I'm right-handed, I write with my right hand. But I purposely make myself write with the left hand. I train my left hand to write. And if you, some of you who are right-handed, if you try to write with your left hand, it looks like kindergarten writing. You still can write by kindergarten. That tells you that the development of your, of your, of your uh, right brain, as far as bringing it forth, is at the kindergarten level. And of course, if you keep doing that for a couple of years, it will grow into secondary level writing and onwards. And uh, so, I force myself, now without thinking, when it, people say, put your hands together, this becomes now the comfortable one, which is strange. So, it, knowing that I'm an analytical person, that my strong point is my left brain, but having forced my comfort level until I'm comfortable with this, uh, and it's now my default mode in computer language. Default mode is the mode that, well, it, it's what comes out on the screen without you doing anything. And so that's my default mode. Now, here's my little challenge to you, to test yourself out as you grow. That, if you constantly do something long enough, your whole being subconsciously adjusts to it. And so every time I did something, I always forced myself to hold my hands this way. It was very, very uncomfortable the way you all experience discomfort. Now question, logically, physically, biologically, physiologically speaking, there shouldn't be anything to cause you discomfort. A hand is a hand is a hand. This way and this way makes no difference as far as the dynamics of gravity, the laws of physics. Makes no difference. But the discomfort level is within your own soul. The leanings of your left brainness or your right brainness. And so when you begin to act out in faith in certain areas, it does change. It does change, believe me. Things begin to happen. It does change on the inside. But even more in our thinking and in Christ's words in our life. So remember, every 
circumstances is with a purpose. No matter how horrible or how painful the experience of life is. You know all life has valleys and mountains, right? Life is that way. And, uh, and no matter how tough or how difficult the circumstances you face, they're up and down. No matter how difficult it is, remember, every circumstance is with one purpose. To bring forth the Christ in you. When you remember that, hold, uh, is there a phrase, hold on to your horses. Hold back all those things that, that you may want to react. Pray for a moment, be still for a moment, and find the grace of God to bring forth the Christ reaction. And if you keep doing it that way, after some time, you are more transformed in Christ. Point two, every thought is important. Every single thought we think, will affect, will become a habit of thinking. The habit of thinking will produce an emotional feeling and inclination. And that emotional thing will one day cause you to take action in a wrong way. If it's the right emotion, then the right thing. And then that action that you take, the first time you do it is difficult. But once you do it, you cross the line becomes easier to do it again and again. And when the action is repeated, it becomes a characteristic and a deformity in your life, which is not good. Now, the four processes can also be positive, which is why we go to the third point. And that is, every day, every minute or every hour, you can call it, to surround yourself with the right things. And uh, we are told in the Bible, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now the word richly means abundantly, in abundance. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in some sins and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, let's say you go to each one of us for 24 hours. Each, within the 24 hours, we, we are conscious for maybe 15 hours uh, or so. 15 hours or 17 hours, depending on how much sleep you need. During the time you are conscious of your day, of the day, if you feel the background of your life with words, praise and worship, the, the Word of God, praise and worship, and good things that keep on coming to you all the time, which is why it's good to always leave the, your cassette or CD or MP3 player on all the time with worship, to leave something on in the background with the Word, and you keep surrounding yourself with the Word all the time, some parts of it will begin to drop on your inside. That means every day, surround yourself with an abundance of the good things. The good word, good worship, good... And you surround yourself and slowly, day to day, it will sink into your system. It will definitely sink into your system. God knows about it and He told the Israelites to do this much as they may not have realized what He was trying to do in their life. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And um, we are told in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that um, when they enter into the land that God has for them, that these are the things, uh, chapter 6, that's it, chapter 6, these are the things that they must do as far as the word of God is concerned. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Onwards, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which the sort, He sought to your fathers, so Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give large and beautiful city, tell them not to forget the Lord, basically. But look at His instruction in verse uh, 6. These words that I command you today shall be in your heart. Verse 7. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a, as on your, as a sign on your hand. You shall, they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. You shall write them on the gates of your house. Think about it. You're surrounded by the Word of God. When you lie down, when you wake up, when you walk, to talk to your children, talk by the way, when you're walking along the way, talk about the Word of God. You know, I mean, if they had a, a cassette player or a CD player or an MP3 player, it, it's wonderful. That's on all the time. So we add on top those things, you know, do it all the time. Surround yourself, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Let it be in abundance in your life. The same way too, the friends we choose. If we choose friends who are constantly negative, if you spend time with people who are constantly negative, believe me, in one year you'll be a negative person. Even though you don't want to be. Because you tend to think that way. Remember what I said? If you give me an opportunity to spend three months with you to find faults in your life, I will find it. And so, if you're a negative person and you, you start looking at people that way, you will find fault with everybody. In the end, there's nobody who can live with you. We've got to transport you on a spaceship to Mars, leave you there with enough oxygen for the rest of your life. And so we realize that in the end, it's our own attitude that we, we need to work on. We need to surround ourselves with, the, with, with people who are positive. Pe- when you surround yourself with people who are loving, people who are prayerful, people who are worshipful, guess what? Even though you are not prayerful, even though you're not worshipful, even though you're not that positive, guess what? It catches on you. Because some things can be taught but some things can only be caught. You, you, you just got to catch the influence of it. You, know, you cannot just get it in a classroom situation. And so the Bible advocates to surround ourselves with an abundance of the Word so that it can start seeping into our lives in a very subconscious way. And almost like indirectly. Indirectly. Now, because you're unique, right? Uh, um, Steve, uh, this is just illustration to us. Are you able to move your ears? You can't move your ears? Can you try moving your ears with the face muscles? Right. Let, here, let me expose his ears now. Okay. Okay, he's trying very hard to move his ear, but he can't. Now, anybody here can move your ears? Oh, yes, yes, Gwen. Gwen can move her ears. Can, can, uh, can you, can, can Bob just, uh, can you do, uh, can you expose the, the right ear since everybody can look at you on your right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to see your ear moving. Wow, you could see the strain on the muscle, right? Okay. Anybody else can move your ear? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever uh, moved your ears? Can you move your ears? You can, yeah? I wonder whether big ears are an advantage. Let me find somebody with big ears. And Glenn, is it an advantage with big ears to move your ear? Can't do it. You can't do it. Okay, now tell me. Right? I will go to you afterwards, right? Tell me, are my ears moving? Are my ears moving? Okay, let me go near. Right here. Okay, now, are my ears moving? Can you see the ears moving? Right. Now that doesn't mean I'm Dumbo the elephant, right? <laughs> but this is part of sermon illustration, right? Now, are, are my ears moving? Yeah. Okay? My ears are moving, right? Now, I move my ears without my hands. I've got some of you who say, Oh, move your ears. And you go, <laughs> right? But move your ears without your hands. And... It is a very indirect, pre- uh, indirect way. Nobody has ear muscles that can move like the hand. Of course not. Right? Nobody can move their, their develop muscles in their ears where your ears can flap like Dumbo the elephant. <laughs> right? No. But because, because your ear, the, ear, the muscle that holds your ear is attached to the muscle underneath the area of your face, 
when you stretch and pull the underneath part of your face, your ears move indirectly. In, in other words, you're pulling the skin. So you activate a part of your muscle that pulls the skin that pulls the ear. Right? Sounds like one of the little Sunday school stories, right? right? The, the boy who pulled the turnip, the pull the this and pull the that, right? So you actually are excess pulling a muscle on your face that pulls the skin, that pulls the ear, because the ear was attached to the skin that was being pulled. So the ears move. It's a very indirect process, and yet, as I show you in the natural, it can be done. It took a long time for me to master this trick, gentlemen, <laughs> right? In order to bring as a sermon illustration. <laughs> I, 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 and before I came to that, I said, okay, let me think about illustration. And I said, okay, you know, I said, I got to practice it for a while, and I go, <laughs> and just to make sure I still could do it. <laughs> I know. But as you can see, some things are done indirectly. Indirectly. Like, like for example, some people like to be fit, you know, physically. And, uh, and, and so, you know, they're concerned about all the, the fat and all the accumulation all over their, their face and everything because the face is the part of a human uh, anatomy that is always encountered first. And so sometimes they do all kinds of... Uh, 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 operation and all this to try to make themselves look nice. But you know, and here's the key, how much is this lot? Right, okay, okay. Now this will save you a thousand dollars of plastic surgery. Okay. The condition of your face, how fat, how skinny, how bony, and how, how much feature it has, depends upon the muscles in your waist. Yes. Yes, it is indirectly connected. When you, when you do mu muscle exercise for your abdomen, you can actually feel something stretch all the way up to your face. Right? Don't do this now, but you can do this after uh, when you go home. Right? When you lie, the way to exercise your abdominal muscles is to lie flat on your back on a flat surface. And normally people would lift their head up and down, right? But that's a difficult way. Do it the other way around. Lie flat on your back on the floor that is level and hard. Then raise your legs up and down. All the way up, all the way down. As high as you can, up and down. And I can guarantee you, if you have not been exercising within the tent lift, you feel all the muscles in your abdomen that you never felt before. You didn't know they exist. Right? The muscul mu muscle areas and the different sets of muscles you didn't know they exist. It's just like, you know, anybody climbs stairs before, right? You, then you realize when you climb a 30-story building by the staircase, somewhere about the 10th floor to the 20th floor, you discover muscles that you never had that are aching. You never know exist. <laughs> Right? But they were there all the time. So, as you lift up your leg, life flat on your leg, lift your leg up and down all the time. And, uh, and by the way, if you do this about 50 times a day, don't, don't do it at one shot, don't do it in the morning, do it in the afternoon, or be at night. You, know, you will find that the muscles in your stomach begin to be strengthened. And as the muscles in your stomach become strengthened, the muscles in your face also tends to get strengthened. I can't explain it, but I know it does. Right. Now, do you know, we all know that there are certain proportions in our body that are related. Like for example, uh, from your wrist to your elbow, the length of your wrist to your elbow is the exact length of your feet. Right. Now, don't, don't, don't do it now, we're about to have lunch, right? So, <laughs> in case you don't wear socks or your socks. Are, all right. Now, the, from your wrist right, to, your, to your elbow... So sometimes when we go to some, some places to, to, to buy things, uh, when you measure a person's, a person's feet, the length of them, that's the length. Right? You, you can go to a quiet place afterward and just check whether that is true. That is true. And the, the, radius, the radius of your neck, right? The radius of your neck. <laughs> Hallelujah. The radius of your neck, let me, I need to give the correct mathematical thing because you fold it, fold it half and then the half goes round. Okay, so the radius of your neck 
is about half the radius of your waist. So, so back in Asia, when we, when we buy things, when we buy things and we wonder whether it fit, we would take a pair of pants, which you fold it into half, right? When, when it's in half. And then you put it around the neck. And you find that it's about, the, it's about that size. It's about half the size of your waist. So naturally, anything that happens on your waistline is going to affect everything that happens around your neck and your lower facial line. Alright, that's given free for you today. <laughs> right. What we are saying here is there are a lot of things that take place indirectly. Because when you try to do it directly, you can't. If any of you try to move your ears directly, you're going to, ter- you're going to struggle until your whole face turns red and still nothing will happen. But when you begin to do it indirectly, it works. So there are some things that in that God can call all us to have an indirect process. In Psalm chapter 1, he says, Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked and all the wrong areas, but who meditate day and night on the word of God. For he shall, or she shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bear fruit in its season. Think about that. Meditation on the word, you become like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bear its fruits in its season. A very indirect tree. The process of a tree taking nourishment and then using chlorophyll to convert sunlight and carbon dioxide into nutrition for the plant and then causing it to form cells and causing it to grow and, and all those things. It's a long process. But the basic thing is just surround the tree with water, sunlight, that's it. And nutrition from the ground. The rest takes care of itself. And the same way, if you surround yourself, the third point, if Every hour, every day, and every minute, you surround yourself with things that are godly, with things that are full of the Word, with things that are praise and worship. It will indirectly seep into you and transform you. Three little points. That's what we have today. Every circumstance is for the purpose of changing us to be more Christ-like. Every thought is to be taken captive in Christ. Every our minute day is to be surrounded by an abundance of the word, praise and worship, and then let the transformation come by itself. Let's pray.